in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I'm going to read from the New King James, verse 11. Ecclesiastes 3, 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. And notice, God has put eternity in the hearts of people. And I want to preach about eternity in our hearts. And you may be seated. If you've heard me preach over the years, some of the things that I might say will sound familiar but I hope to share some insight here. When I was reading the scripture this year in Ecclesiastes, this particular verse struck me as never before. Eternity in our heart. What an apt description of what it means to be human. Now, if you just listen to secular scientists, they will say that humans are simply intelligent animals. There's really no qualitative difference between us and a dog or an ape, or for that matter, a fly, except that we're marginally more intelligent. To read some, uh, it's questionable as whether we are actually more intelligent. And uh, I know over the years of pastoring, sometimes you do wonder. But I suppose we've all encountered people that made us wonder. But when you really think about it, there is a huge difference because according to Genesis chapter 1, human beings were created in the image of God. And there's something about humans that are unique because we have eternity in our hearts. And whether someone is a Christian or not, there still is that truth that people are created in God's image and they have eternity in their hearts. There's something about every human being that longs for the eternal, that has an affinity with the eternal. Even though we've never been to heaven, there's something in the human heart that bears witness that we belong in eternity, not merely in time. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes is kind of a philosophical book. It, it uh, explores human life and human experience from a human perspective. The key phrase is under the sun. That is on planet earth, not in heaven, but in human experience. And so the writer talks about how he tried to study and learn great things, but in the end he found it was all vain and useless. And he tried to uh, amass great sums of money and build houses and have vineyards and have all the wealth the world could offer, but it really was meaningless. He tried to pursue pleasure, and then on and on it goes, and, and he says there's really nothing under the sun. Some have seen it as a very negative book for that reason, but you have to realize it is deliberately speaking from the human point of view. And no matter how much we humans accomplish, no matter how much success or pleasure we attain in this life, really if all we have is this life, it's nothing compared to eternity. And, of course, Ecclesiastes does not end there, but he says, well, this is the whole duty of man, to fear God and keep his commandments. I've found that under the sun, you really cannot attain eternal success. You really cannot fulfill your God-given purpose. The only way you can do that is to listen to God and follow his commandments. And then you're not just under the sun. You're now reaching up beyond the sun into eternity. And so in the midst of this discussion of human nature, he gives this little point that underscores his ultimate conclusion. Because when God created humans, he put eternity in their heart. That's why no amount of money can satisfy the soul. That's why no amount of pleasure can satisfy the soul. Because we're not just people of flesh and blood, and that's all. If we were just flesh and blood, then maybe material things would suffice. But because we have eternity in our hearts, there's something that longs for the supernatural. There's something that longs for the eternal. There's something that is never satisfied without the presence of the Lord. And that's why people pursue pleasure in so many ways but never find it. Because eternity is in their hearts. If you read Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. 
And what's interesting, we think of heaven. Of course, the physical heaven, the atmosphere and outer space, but we also think of heaven as the dimension beyond human knowledge, the presence of God and his angels. And so when the Bible says heaven and earth, we think of the dwelling place of God and we think of the dwelling place of humans. And so the angels are obviously in heaven, the dwelling place of God. People are obviously on earth the dwelling place of humans. The animals, they're obviously on the earth. But there's something different about humans because actually we're in the middle. We have a little bit of heaven and a little bit of earth. We're both. That's what makes us different. We're not bound to the earth. Even in a human sense, we look up into the skies and we long to know what's out there. In fact, humans have gone to the moon and walked upon the moon. That's incredible when you think of that and you look at the moon. Just in recent months, spaceships that we launched, what, 20, 30 years ago, have gone by the planets and gone by Pluto and taken amazing photographs. I don't know if you've seen them. But why would we care about those things? We'll never go there. It never makes a difference to our lives because there's something in the human spirit that wants to reach into the unknown, that wants to go as far as we can go, that wants to reach as high as we can reach. No matter how intelligent or beloved your pet might be, there's no evidence that your pet desires to see the stars, desires to step on the moon, desires to... Get the latest photos of Pluto or would even appreciate it if you gave them to him or her. Perhaps something to gnaw on. There's something different about humans because eternity is locked up in our hearts. When we read about that, when we look into the stars, there's something that pulls us in a different direction. That itself should be a witness of the presence of God. We are both of heaven and earth. And those that are simply relegated to heaven, although that seems superior, yet they cannot comprehend us. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, the angels desire to look into our experience with God. The angels who behold God's face, they dwell in his presence, they glorify him, yet they don't know what it's like to live on the earth, to go through trials and to overcome, to be victorious, to be redeemed. They would like to know our experience as beings who are both heaven and earth. The animal kingdom, we can have a certain relationship on a human level with animals, but but again, they have no consciousness of the presence of God. So when it comes to church, there's no connection. When it comes to play, there can be a connection. When it comes to food, there can be a connection. When it comes to emotions, there can be a connection. But when it comes to the presence of God, there's no connection. Isn't that amazing? We're not strictly beings of heaven, and we're not strictly beings of earth. We're both heaven and earth. In fact, Romans 8 says, this whole world is under the bondage of sin. And it's groaning and travailing in pain, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The entire animal kingdom, the entire, even the inanimate world with its convulsive volcanoes and earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes, it's shuddering, waiting for that time when peace will rule and reign the physical planet as well as the social lives of human beings. What is it waiting for? It's waiting for Jesus Christ to come back to earth and take charge as King of kings and Lord of lords. It's waiting for his saints to be revealed with him him, for they will rule with him as kings and priests. So the planet itself is waiting for us to be revealed for who we are. Isn't it amazing that all heaven and all earth are standing in attention waiting for the revelation of the saints of God? Amazing. The angels are watching to see what's going to happen. And even the physical planet and everything that's in it is waiting, not really knowing, but groaning for that day of revelation. 
when the curse of sin will be removed and God's plan for planet Earth will finally be implemented where the lion will lie down with the lamb and there will be peace throughout the earth. And we are right there in the middle. God has a plan for us. Human life is unique. Think about this. When we face death, we don't face it philosophically. Even, of course, when a young person dies, it's tragedy. But even when an older person passes away, and we kind of say, well, they had a long life and a wonderful life, and now they're in heaven and so forth. And we console ourselves with those statements and thoughts. But there's still something in us that says, but that's not fair. But I miss them. But I want to see them. You mean I'll never hear the sound of their laugh again? I'll never hear their unique wit, their their ways? I'll never? No, that can't be. There's something not right about that. Something within us protests and say death cannot be final because that's a human being. That's a personality. That's a soul of 7 billion people on planet Earth. There's no one like that person. No one laughs the way that person laughs. No one uh, cries the way that person cries. No one worships the way that person worships. It's an irretrievable loss to our family, to our church, to our society. How can that be? Why? Because there's eternity in our heart. Something tells us, whether we're Christians or not, you were created for eternity. Your family was created. Your friends were created not just to live and pass away, and that's the end, and just honor their memory. But something says you should be living on. Something says that soul should be living on. Because eternity is in our hearts. And that's why we never just become philosophical about death and say, just one of those things. We're never reconciled to that. That's why you live the rest of your life. If a close loved one is is gone before you, you never, you never get over it. You can have peace with God. You can be consoled. But it's never the same. Why? Because they're eternal souls. And that's why the hope of the Christian is so great. Because one day, we'll meet them again. And we will be reconciled in the presence of the Lord. Eternity's in our heart. You know, our, our brains can think about eternity. We can't even comprehend it. Yet we can think about it. Can you, can you explain eternity forever and ever and ever? But yet we're thinking about it. Can you explain infinity? But yet we're thinking about it. When you look up in the sky, you can see, maybe not in Austin, but if you get out in the dark, you could see a few thousand stars. You know, it's, it's surprising when you live in the city, those rare occasions where you get in a truly dark place, how brilliant the night sky is, how amazing the thousands of stars, actually seeing the Milky Way and so forth. It's incredible. But you know, those stars are only a slight portion of what's really out there, according to the scientists. The scientists, not the theologians, tell us that we live in a galaxy called the Milky Way. And there are 200 billion galaxies like ours. In fact, ours is a rather ordinary Small galaxy or medium galaxy, 200 billion. We can't even imagine that number. So that means the the scientific estimates, the astronomers estimate that in the visible universe, the known universe, there are 30 sextillion stars, which if I've got that right, I think that means three followed by 22 zeros. We can't even comprehend the number. That's what the scientists tell us. They say the observable universe started about 14 billion years ago by their calculations, by human time, which is relative. Who knows in God's time what that amounts to? A few, few days, few thousand years, whatever. But they say we've traveled, traveling at the speed of light, It takes 14 billion years uh, to go to where 
the universe started, but the universe, they say, is much bigger than 14 billion light years across because they say the universe itself has been expanding like a balloon. So it's been carrying all those stars with it much faster than the speed of light. So they say that the diameter of our universe from one to the other of the observable universe, what they can calculate at least, is 93 billion light years. And I don't even want to try to figure out what that means in miles. But I will tell you, light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. So a light beam, you know, the, the, the earth is only about 24,000 uh, miles in circumference at the equator. So light can go round and round the earth, what, six or seven times in one second. So at that speed, it would take 93 billion light years, not seconds, to cross what they say is the visible or observable or calculable universe. These numbers are meaningless to us. They're just very, very, very big. But that's what people, that some of whom don't even believe in God, that's what they can think. Eternity is in their heart. They're thinking the literally unthinkable. They're imagining literally the unimaginable. Shouldn't that say there's something more to you than flesh and blood? There's something in your soul that's eternal that you can think the infinite. And we stand in awe. Have you ever had that feeling of awe looking up into the night sky or looking at the Rocky Mountains or looking at the Gulf of Mexico? Have you ever had a sense of awe, something bigger than me? That's because eternity is in your heart. Have you ever had a sense of beauty, of seeing? That's just beautiful. The rainbow, the sunset. Just looking at the leaves. I was in New York a few days ago and all the multicolored leaves and flying from the air. Just amazing to see the patchwork of colors all across the ground. There's why would there be a sense of beauty? There's really no thought that animals sit in awe and say, that's beautiful. I love those colors. They're just calculating whether they can eat them or not. <laughs> but there's something in us that says that's beautiful. If we're just evolved apes, why do we think things are beautiful? Why is there a sense of a joy, just, just an overwhelming excitement in, when we encounter some things? Beautiful music. And, why, why do we have these emotions? Because there's something more than just flesh and blood. There's eternity in our heart. We are contemplating God's creation. When we look at his creation, we're in a, in a small way thinking God's thoughts after him. Whatever God was thinking when he planned that, we, we're thinking those same thoughts, and we're participating in the divine joy, divine beauty. And then we find out human beings, yet we can create things, whether we're saved or not. We can create beautiful music, beautiful paintings, beautiful songs. Even a four-year-old child can come up with the amazing statements that nobody in the history of the universe has ever said. There's no way anybody could have said that before. Isn't that incredible? And then we can take joy in what others have done. So I told you I was in New York City. I was in New York, upstate New York and New York City, both. The last time I flew and I was coming towards the east and there was a perfect view outside. The, I was on the, the window, a small plane, and it banked all the way around New York City. And so I started with the harbor. I could see the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, Manhattan, Brooklyn, come around to Queens, Bronx, Long Island, and I could see the buildings right there. We got pretty close, and I was just taking pictures nonstop. I was just in awe. And, of course, I went to the, the Liberty Tower the, or the Freedom Tower, they call it, the World Trade Center, the replacement, tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. Went up into that, and then I got a panorama of the city all around. And I, I'm just in awe. And that's just what humans did. That's not even what God did. That's just what we do. 
But still, there's this amazing ability of humans to create and imagine and fulfill and for other humans to stand in awe and appreciation. There's a connection with God. There's a connection with the eternal. Atheists talk about how come there's suffering in the world, and there are lots of reasons. Number one reason is human sinfulness has brought tragedy in the world. But atheists have this problem of why is there, why is there pleasure in the world? Why is there beauty in the world? Why is there joy in the world? There's nothing that in evolution that would say you would enjoy things, except maybe your next meal. But even then, that's only a very basic joy. You just have to discern what, if you're a carnivore, what meat tastes like. And if you're, you know, herbivore, you, you have to appreciate things that are not poisonous and that are healthy for you. But there's no, there's no reason why you should enjoy a gourmet meal. There's no reason why you should enjoy a beautiful painting. There's no reason why you should enjoy beautiful music. There's no reason at all that you should enjoy anything like that except your basic food for survival on a very basic level. But there's something, what I'm just trying to say with all these illustrations, there's something more than what science can tell us. There's something more than what mathematics can calculate. There's something more than what politicians can prove. There's something in our hearts. And the Bible says it's eternity. It's God's nature placed in human flesh. There's a sense of morality, right and wrong. There's a sense of justice. We want, we want right to prevail, whatever our belief of right and wrong. We, we don't want evil people to get away with evil things and die successful and never have a judgment. Even people that don't believe in God, they want to believe in karma. They want to believe that somehow your bad things will catch up with you sooner or later. Why should we care? You know, when you see a big dog Attacking a little dog, do you say, I hope you go to the judgment one day? We don't worry about that, and the dogs certainly don't worry about that. But we worry when we read about somebody abusing a child. We say, I hope they get caught. I hope they're put in jail for a long time. And if they get away with murder, I hope they face the judgment. Why? Because there's eternity in our hearts. We have a sense of right and wrong, justice, morality, truth. Even when we try to deny it, it's still there. And so what am I, what's my point? Most of all, we have an ability to commune with God. Even if you've never been in a church before, you can come into the presence of God and you will feel something you never felt before. That's why many of you are here tonight. That's why the Pentecostal movement has grown around the world. Not because we're smarter than everybody, not because we preach better than everybody, not because our buildings are better or music is better, but because you can walk into an atmosphere of worship and praise and you feel something you've never felt before. And it calls to your soul. And even though you might say, why is that person acting crazy? They're jumping up and down. I would never do that. Why is that person yelling so loud? I would never do that. Even though while mentally you're saying, that's crazy, that's ignorant, I would never do that. At the same time, there's something in your soul that says, what is that? I've seen people sit with a frown on their face and their arms folded. When everybody's worshiping, you can tell they're determined not to worship. And you look down and their toes just had happened. <laughs> they're being drawn into it in spite of themselves. They're feeling something in spite of themselves. I've seen them stand with a scowl, and you'd think, boy, they didn't hear anything, and what they heard, they rejected it. And all of a sudden, you see a tear begin to flow. It's not because they're susceptible, they're emotional, they're primed, they've been taught this. No, it's because they're encountering the eternal. And something in the presence of God touches something deep in their own soul that's never one time been stirred before. Oh, I feel the presence of God right now. The Spirit is bearing witness right now with our spirit. And so what am I saying? What do we need to do with this feeling of eternity? Don't deny it. Don't squelch it. Don't ignore it. Don't just channel it into work-related pursuits or leisure activities. 
Don't trivialize it, but open your heart to the call of God. The Lord is calling each one of us. Seek that presence of God. Treasure that presence of God. Because you'll find it in Jesus Christ. Think about Jesus Christ. He was God manifested in the flesh. He was heaven on earth. There's an amazing little passage, 1 Timothy 3.16. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. And it goes on to say, seen of angels. The angels were amazed. They knew God. They knew the presence of God. They knew what it felt like to encounter God in heaven. But when God came on earth in human flesh, that shocked the angels. They're looking to say, look what God is doing. He's become part of earth. He's taken on flesh and blood. What is he doing? And when Jesus died on the cross, literally he was hanging between heaven and earth. His arms are spread out. Symbolically, he's covering the whole earth. And his body is uniting heaven and earth. In Jesus Christ, you will encounter God manifested in the flesh. You will encounter eternity wrapped up in human flesh. At the cross of Jesus Christ, you will find the answer to your needs and your problems. I'm not saying you'll never go through a trial, but I'm saying if you are going through a trial right now, do not despair. Identify with the Lord Jesus Christ who suffered and died for you. He's been where you are. He's gone through what you're going through. Maybe not the exact details, but he suffered and bled and died. He took on the punishment of the sins of the whole world. He knows exactly what it's like to be of both heaven and earth. He rose again on the third day. He won victory over death, hell, and the grave. He is your way into eternity. He's gone before you as a true human being who conquered death and conquered sin. He's gone into eternity. He's coming back for a people, and he will take us to be with him for eternity. There's your answer. Whatever your questions, Jesus is the answer. Whatever your problems, Jesus is the solution. Whatever your sin, Jesus is the Savior. Whatever your bondage, Jesus is the deliverer. Whatever your sickness, Jesus is the healer. I'm telling you, it's all in Jesus, the eternal God manifest in the flesh, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. It's all in Jesus. So I challenge us today, seek a relationship with the Almighty God. Seek a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. God created us for eternity. He created us to have fellowship with Him. And everything I've mentioned tonight is only an inkling, a faint glimpse. What we experience in the Holy Ghost is only The Bible itself says, just the first fruits, not the main harvest, just the fruit that gets right before the main harvest. It's the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance. It's not the full purchase price. It's just the initial money that guarantees the rest of the deal. And so what we've experienced is only just a small portion of what God has planned for us. We're only beginning to feel the tug of eternity. And everything that I mentioned, those are only faint stirrings and intimations and tugs. But the reality is far more glorious than we can ever imagine We don't really know what it's going to be like, but the Bible says we know that we are going to be with him and we will be like him and we will see him as he is. One day there will be no obscurity. One day we will see face to face. Now we look in a mirror darkly, obscurely, but then face to face. I'm looking for that day. Ecclesiastes is right. You're never going to find full satisfaction in this world. Because eternity is bound up in your heart. You're only going to find satisfaction when you have a relationship with God through Christ Jesus. And then eternity will begin. We have eternal life now, but we're just grasping it. We're just at the very beginning of it. But one day, it will expand to the full horizon. Don't you want to be part of eternity? Whatever it takes to get there. That's what we've got to do. Let's repent of our sins, our failures, 
anything that has caused us to drift from God or to break fellowship with God. Let's renew our relationship. If we've never had a relationship, let's establish one. Because Jesus Christ came to bring eternity down to earth. And he came to bring us back to eternity. It's not a physical location, but it's a relationship. And it's eternal plan and destiny. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel the presence of the Lord so strongly. Hallelujah. It's amazing that with all of our failures, with all of our imperfections, all of our mistakes, all of our bad choices, all of our poor judgment, yet God loves us. And it's like a magnet pulling us. Don't resist the pull of the Holy Ghost, which is like a magnet comes and the metal all aligns to the direction of that magnetic field. Let's align our hearts here tonight. I feel like the Lord is speaking to somebody here tonight. It's time to line up your heart in the direction that God wants it to go. Don't live with such a narrow horizon as if you are only an intelligent animal. But lift your eyes up and see your full potential as a child of God. Young person, God has a plan for you that's so much greater than what you can see. And even if you're in your senior years and you feel like there's not much you can do, your very presence, your very worship, your very prayer is vitally important to this congregation. And God treasures that because there's no one who prays exactly like you pray. There's no one who worships exactly like you worship. There's no one who communes with God exactly like you commune with God. You have a place in God's eternal purpose. He placed eternity in your heart. Heaven is bound up with earth in your own life. So reach out to heaven right now. Reach out to your destiny. Reach out to the home or you've never yet been. The Lord is speaking expressly to some people here tonight. If the Lord is drawing you, would you come to the front right now? If you'd like to invite someone to come pray with you, why don't you come and kneel or stand here? If you need to make some things right with God, if you need to confess some things to God, let's do it right now. If you need a personal renewing, if you're going through a struggle, put it in the hands of God. Do not despair. Do not give up. There is yet a miracle to take place. You've got to hold on to eternity. Hold on. Don't let go. Reach up as high as you can reach to eternity. The answer is there. God is speaking to you. I'd like, as you feel led, as appropriate, why don't you pray with someone? Offer to pray together. Two or three may bind together in prayer. Would you do that right now? It's still early. I haven't preached a long time. Why don't you take a few minutes to pray? Would you like to come to the front? Everybody's invited. If you prefer to stay where you are, that's okay too. But take a few moments to pray. God's reaching out to somebody here tonight. Heaven is touching earth. Heaven is touching earth. Eternity is touching time. Reach out to God right now.